so what does one say to the couple who has already put out so much of their time and energy in sharing their experiences with pretty much the world out there the world of filmmaking and the world that they've inhabited for so long so that's been very generous of you guys and it's a big tribute that we have to pay to you to uh, you, you know and the fact that you agreed also to make this time it's a pleasure <laughs> when i was first told that okay this uh, this session might happen actually i was reminded of a of a film sequence which actually was written by a famous indian playwright in which there are two brothers talking and the younger one asked the elder one uh, uh, but i've asked you so many times before and you've always refused me and the elder one says you should have asked one more time maybe this time you would have got a different answer <laughs> yeah it's in, that, it's in that way in that we will be speaking with you today all right right <laughs> okay so starting out as an art student then graduating to still photography i think you met a mentor who influenced you and your early assignment yeah. your first assignment was as a still photographer a young person in your own uh, neighborhood in your country doing kind of documentary kind of stills and then a documentary filmmaking anthropological documentaries i'm told which make you travel and eventually you come to narrative or fiction filmmaking with the films of a of a uk director these are all in my view all visual art forms but there is a distinction so how would you kind of describe these different ways of seeing as it were yeah Uh, yeah i don't yeah you know my the <laughs> life takes you on a journey doesn't it and you kind of make decisions and find you're in a different place uh, i am not sure it was very well structured i mean i i got to say when i went to art college it was more because i didn't know what to i wanted to do but i knew what i didn't want to do which was to stay at home and anyway just you know work a local job i didn't i wanted to i wanted to stretch myself somehow but i didn't know how so art college just seemed like a very good way to kind of get out to really get away from home um i i i wanted to be a still photographer i loved i loved uh, i loved looking at the work of photojournalists and uh i guess that's in my mind where i was going to go but then a, a friend talked about the national film school that was opening in the uk and then i i so i thought my work my painting had always been quite naturalistic um slightly surrealistic but naturalistic and and my photography was always like street photography i just loved just observing and and photographing reality so then that sort of led to the idea of being a you know in documentary filmmaking it, it seemed like obviously you have a series of images and you have sound you can explore the the subject more than you know it's different than taking a still photograph i mean there's similarities in the way you approach composition and the juxtaposition of ideas within a frame maybe but you know obviously a documentary is is utilizing different shots different angles to tell a broader story So I I thought exploring that would be really good. And so I yeah, I worked in documentary for quite some time, but at the same time I was doing um some TV drama and uh short film drama and a lot of music videos. Um but it was really I I became a little bit uneasy with documentaries because you're I got became uneasy with the sort of idea of being a voyeur. I did a yeah, I did a couple of anthropological films shot um and I did uh, a film in Rhodesia when it was Rhodesia uh, uh, about the war there and um I did a film in Eritrea following the um EPLF guerrillas in in Eritrea and you find yourself like put in a situation where you you get very involved and you get to know those people and you you become very close to those people but then after whatever it is 2 months 3 months or something suddenly you're taken out of that and you go off and do something else and it's almost like 
exploitational in a way. And the last couple of films I did with a friend were in a, a mental hospital it was about schizophrenia. And that's where it hit me the most. That in a funny kind of way, I felt that I was exploiting people. Yes, you kind of think you're doing you're doing a service by portraying something that an issue that needs to be confronted. But on the other hand, you personally are in some way exploiting exploiting that situation for your own end. So anyway, it just happened that that time I got the opportunity to start working in in features, and 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 I took it. You know. I think I was uh, I was also trying to probe and uh, lead into the fact that you know there are over time you develop certain uh, how should I say it in intuitions or instincts of when you read a screenplay for example uh, the visualization starts coming to you and that happens over time so so I mean did the still photography journey and the documentary journey also help you in this process because you do have a certain approach or a certain visual uh, style which carries through, although there are varied films. But uh, Well, I, I think, you know, uh, you're taking a still photograph. It's your decision where you put yourself, your decision what you put in the frame, how you balance that frame, uh, you know, how close, how far you are from the subject, all those other things. And then you go into a documentary and it's, there's those same sort of, techniques apply but then obviously it's in a more i wouldn't say a more complex way but it's in a, in, in, a, in a more um you have to think about the whole story yeah more involved way you have to yeah, exactly yeah you have to think about the whole subject and story and in in a, in, a, in a broader sense and i certainly took those kind of ways of seeing if you like into what i do as a cinematographer on feature work yeah i i mean i my work is very re reactive, really. Uh, you know, I might I might sit with a director for months and months talking through a script, but it's always I'm always reacting to the words on the page. And then, primarily, when we're shooting or looking at locations, I am reacting to those things in front of me rather than actually, um, rather than really preconceiving things so much. You know. So I, let me just uh, also quickly ask James a very direct question is that, uh, you know, once the image leaves the sensor and starts going through the circuit boards and into the drives, at least some cinematographers feel that the mystery deepens there. <laughs> so, <and> then, <laughs> yeah, I'm one. <laughs> no, and, um... and a friend of mine once called it massaging the data. <laughs> yeah. No, I I was just going to ask that, you know, keeping in mind or keeping in line with Roger's philosophy of keeping it simple, how do you keep that line straight? How what are the do's and don'ts of post flow that uh, that you follow maybe on his films? Okay. Um it's basically uh every day I go in and I look at it when I can and and make sure that everything's fine. Talk with the timer. We do have a timer on right from the beginning and make sure that there's no issues. We beforehand, I just make sure that we're all clear on what the LUT is, what um, the deliverables are, and, and just get that set up. And then I do a document. So everybody has that document and knows step by step what everything's, uh, what what's going on basically. And then I also work very closely with the visual effects people on set because you know how oftentimes they want to do something that the cinematographer doesn't want to do. They want a blue screen up there, but the cinematographer doesn't want it. And because I do have a technical bent and I know what Roger wants, Sick. I can go and um, talk to the visual effects people and say, well, what is it that you want? Oh, well, can't we do it this way and and sort of negotiate with them so there isn't that tension between the cinematographer and the visual effects people. You know, I, I try and make sure they realize we're all on the same team. We can find the answer. Mm. Um, so that is so much. I mean, I think so much of that is is because you're trying to protect the image as it was shot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Rather than have the effects work sort of 
distract or overtake or in in any way alter the feeling of the original image so so what you do and what we do in the di which yeah. we're doing now you know post di is really just is taking the original image and maybe just changing a bit of saturation or, or my, minor details we don't really do do much in post in right. terms of altering the image it's more about protecting it isn't it so i'm talking with them as we're shooting to make sure that i talk to them about what we think they're doing and then they can talk back to me and say oh no we're going to do this and that and then I bring that to the attention of Roger and the director. Wait, I didn't think we were going to do this. So mm. we're all very clear on what's actually going to be done to the image because the, we try and shoot an image that's basically there. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, I worked on <laughs> I worked on film for how many years? <laughs> 40, <laughs> 50 years. So, so, you know, I still work that way. I, I think the image is captured in the camera is is the is is key uh so the do's and don'ts so don't stretch the image don't think you can create the image in post you know don't think you can uh manipulate it to 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 create a mood or a feeling in post you can't I mean I don't think you can you that's that's for that's for on set and I, I think another thing too that's helpful is that I'm there when they're shooting and I know what Roger's yeah. looking for. And then when I actually check the dailies, if something's gone a different way, I can bring it up as an issue and we can, so it's not like when we get into the DI, oh my God, this wasn't what we thought. Right. So, because sometimes Roger doesn't get the chance to see dailies every day because of hours or whatever. So I'm just, I'm sort of, uh, another set of eyes for Roger only because we talk about it all the time. I know exactly mm. what it is that he mm. wants. And um, I'm trying to make sure Roger can focus on the visual and I deal with the other stuff, which is the workflow, which is talking to the producers, which is talking to the production manager about the crane next week and all those things that get in the way of thinking about the image. We split it off that way. Mm. No, I mean, also, it's uh, reassuring to hear that the approach is very uh, visual. It's not so technical in, in that sense. Oh, very much. I think there's a thing these days that technology sort of takes over, you know, but it shouldn't be that way. I mean, I, you know, I think you have to know technology to a certain extent, you know, after like shooting film, you have to know, you know, color science and stuff to a certain degree. But all those things you want to forget when you're actually shooting, you know, it should be your relationship to the subject. That's what's important, not not what's happening in the machine, not what's happening in the workflow, you know. And in the in this era of multiple deliverables of HDR, SDR, <laughs> DCPs, yeah, really, <laughs> that also flows seamlessly for you or do you have uh, stress points there? <laughs> I stress out on everything. That's why James, you know, deals with that really. What we try and do is basically um, work on the, the the theatrical release, the DCP first, and then we use that to match to. So we get everyone to approve that, and then when we have to do HDR, when we have to do home deliverables, we just say we say, okay, let's match what's been approved and mm -hmm. sometimes we we were in a situation where the studio showed up one day when we were doing hdr home delivery um and they wanted it brighter because that's they could sell it as a different, a different element a different as element. it turns out and we of course had to we wanted to match the uh the theatrical release so that meant i had to go out of the room call up directors call up producers and stop it right away because and then we locked the door so no <laughs> one could come in <laughs> yeah we shouldn't be telling that story I know. no no <laughs> it's good it's very reassuring yeah. to hear that those like you said the vfx tension those are, yeah that they are all common syndromes yeah, yes, they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> so I just wanted to also open up the house. And uh, Ravi is a cinematographer, also of a lot of experience in our 
environment. Ravi has a question for you, Raja. I think. Hi, Raja. Hi, James. Hi. Hi. How are you? Hi. Good. So I've been watching all your films right from your uh, earlier films onwards, and uh, <clears throat> and you know uh, I notice every film has got a different tone and style to it, but there's no signature uh, composition or signature lighting or anything. But you don't experiment with a lot of uh, uh, new uh, cameras or new lenses, or you're not a big fan of LED lights. How do you achieve this uh, difference in every film? Is it because of your uh, uh, pre-production, or is it because of your choice of stories, or the compositions, or the choreography? Well, it's always a collabor collaboration with a director. You know, and you find the path you're going to go down. You know, uh, I mean, I'm. I, we're always choosy about projects. I mean, I don't like to repeat myself because that's, that's just not interesting um so really it's about that collaboration and yes it's a lot of pre-production and thought goes into the sort of style of it but um you know actually I've got to go back to say you say not, I'm not a fan of LED lights well <laughs> I am now but I wasn't um the last film we mostly used LEDs but now there's LED lights there's a a, a a lamp we were using that is equivalent to a 1K Fresnel. And I mean, it's a really good LED. So that's why I didn't really use LEDs a lot. I mean, I was using them on Skyfall. I've been using LEDs a lot, but but only certain soft lights up until now. Uh, and, and I say, I think now those those LED Fresnel light, lights are actually becoming um, equivalent or even, well, better because you've got more control over color color and 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 density without using wires and gels and all that so it's actually a, a big advantage now over at conventional film lights the one thing that i still love about using a conventional halogen tungsten light is that you know you dim it and it warms up you know where there's leds it's all about programming and sometimes that's still not quite as intuitive as it is working with a tungsten source so you know i mean i i I do, you know, I mean, I do look into new technologies. Like I knew I was probably the, we were the first people to do a DI, you know, mm. uh, finish a, a post a film uh, digitally. So, But then we took years to do it again because yeah. it was a mess in the beginning. It's, it's not like, it's not like it's, um, I'm against it. I kind of do keep up with all new technologies, but it's where you use it. I don't, want to use it just because it's new i mean when we did 1917 i'm going on now <laughs> when we did 1917 we used you know a stabilizing system that hadn't been used much i mean it's a very used system now but it hadn't been used nearly as much on one film as we used it you know so you 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 pick these things that that and that that work on for particular project or particular shot particular usage and sometimes you wait for the technology to catch up because if, for instance in the case of digital cameras we hadn't seen anything yeah. that we really liked until they showed us when it was in prototype stage yeah, uh, some alexa. footage from the alexa and then okay we're ready yeah it's, it's, it's always right. there's always a tipping point i mm -hmm. mean my my what's important to me is that it doesn't distract from what I'm doing, I still feel myself like, like I'm there with uh, with my Leica stills camera, which is the simplest stills camera really still being made, um, and that's it. I just want that simplicity. So I don't want technology to get in the way. But as soon as it helps that simplicity, then I embrace it. Yeah. You know. Thank you very much. So how do you how do you react to all the young people saying, "Oh, the bokeh of those lenses and the aberrations at the edges of those lenses and the lack of character in the, in the master primes, which you are <laughs> been your closest allies for the longest time"? How do you react to that? Because there's a lot of that these days. There is a lot of that, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm not react to that actually, <laughs> but I, I will say that. Most people watch, <clears throat> I even saw a director once watching a movie on an iPhone. And, <laughs> and so I'm not sure they can really tell the bokeh or, or, or what lens it was shot on on the iPhone. So, you know. 
I'll, I'll leave it at that. No, oh, no, I won't. I'll leave it at one one point years ago. I mean, I loved Sergi Leone Westerns, right? Sergi Leone Westerns was shot on, what was it, a, a Technovision, which not even using a full 35 mil frame. I rest my case. <laughs> it's not it's not the technology it's the eye behind it no I'm, I'm actually going to probe it a little further in the sense that you know there's a lot of conversations about uh, how uh, the image because of digital cinematography has gotten to uh, look clinically clean and therefore uh, there are, there are a whole bunch of young people who are kind of reacting to that and saying no we need to add the texture we need to bring the aberrations back we need to kind of uh, you know let's see some well they miss the grain i guess but you know so they are fighting for that in the image making yeah it's interesting the, the first the first film we we worked on with a digital camera within time and and talking with the director we we had intended to put grain on it and we got to we got to the end and thought no no why and then the next one was skyfall and again i talked to sam mendes about adding grain <laughs> and then we saw it at the end and thought no why do we need to add grain and, and i was always a big fan of grain and maybe on the right film i would add grain but um I've got to really like the image and I'm I'm not sure what people are seeing. I mean, yes, certain cameras I feel are too sharp and there's too much resolution. But if you want to use a, you know, 65 mil camera, then what are you going to get? Why are you using it? Do you use a 65 mil camera and then add grain? That seems a bit ridiculous. Do you <laughs> do you add you use a 65 mil camera, and then you use a an old lens from 1950? <laughs> I mean, why? It doesn't really make sense to me. And anyway, I find all that a distraction. I mean, I could I could shoot a film on an iPhone. It's where you put the lens, you know, it's your relationship to the subject. That's that's so, so important, you know. No, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. It's just that, you know, you hear all this and you yeah. mm. sometimes make yeah. me insecure. <laughs> so. I, 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 yeah, I, I don't I don't really understand it. Uh, uh, we have uh, Shaji in the room, very senior uh, director, uh, a film director and a cinematographer, part of our uh, ISC group, one of our founding members. Uh, Shaji, sir, uh, please go ahead and ask your question. Just remember to unmute. Yes, uh, thank you. It's a lovely moment with you to listen to you. It's a, it's a wonderful and to say that I have watched most of your films in big screens and that oh. itself uh, uh, that was my wonderful experience in one way and another thinking about your images in such a big screen to me is the amount of spirituality spirituality you wanted to create through the shades of the lights and particularly your camera movement which impressed rather like a, a student in my side, looking at multiple cameras and then you come to see that this same thing is being focused from different angles and then you cut into the kind of uh, single view from like you have two eyes and still you see it from your point of view, but seeing from different angles and then cutting back to the same kind of clarity in seeing and watching the way you want wish to see the film with the spirituality. How do you attain that kind of spirituality to your idea of the color, the idea of the light, or the idea of moving the images? Yeah, it's so much about collaboration with the director and discussion about it beforehand. Often, I mean, working with Joel and Ethan Cohen over the years, it, it always been about storyboarding the whole movie before we actually started shooting um so there's various ways of doing it and when i was working with denny Villeneuve on say sicario for instance we would sit in the office with the door shut um for for weeks you know just going through the script and sketching ideas and and um same on blade runner so there's a lot of prep but um but then 
there's also having a relationship with a director so you can be more instinctive on set when you're when you're relating to how the actors are performing or how everything is working on the day with the light and the, the situation so i think goes back to what we were talking about earlier i mean for me that sort of sensibility for me has come from documentary from stills photography and documentary really and then obviously experience over the years but i don't know that i've changed that much since since the days of doing you know sid and nancy or something i don't i don't think my i don't think my way of seeing has changed my way of putting myself in a position or translating what i'm seeing in front of me i, I think that techniques have changed but not not fundamentally what i'm doing i think also going through the script with the director you talk about what each scene means and whose point of view it is and what's important yeah. in that scene so yeah. you've kind of have that in you and then you go on set and you're able to react instinctively but you know what the scene needs to convey and what yeah the yeah i mean i only work on films that are really about character uh and and uh yeah i mean i don't work on action movies and per se you know even i even skyfall is really about character so it's a, my, the, the camera's always it's always the camera's relationship to a person or different people it's not about shooting big action just for the sake of it or just not for the sake of it but you know isn't they're not they're not action films so much as they're character studies i say even skyfall but all the others certainly so i like to ask the, the because you worked with coen brothers number of films and the the kind of look which you gave to different films uh, in terms of the uh, the landscapes and then the lights in sight which you matched it so perfectly uh, that uh, the kind of quality which you gave to us is something uh, unimaginable for us and then the same way, the way that that uh, the 1917 which you worked with uh, stream you know, long lengthy uh, scenes and shots and everything matching right. it everything putting it together the uh, kind of uh, the compositions you wish to place it together how much the art, uh, production designer of course naturally could able to had a, a, a previous discussions over it how you done it right. before was it a kind of a, a storyboard or is it a kind of a, a kind of the thoughts which you reconstructed in some image forms and then you worked later um you thought we don't really like 1917 is interesting because because i think over the years i've been tending more to less camera movement for instance <laughs> and then suddenly the you know, sound approach talks about this film that was just one camera move <laughs> um you know but that's an interesting you know that's an interesting situation really where it's such a blend between uh your your conceptualization of how the film was going to work visually and the technology that you that's required to make that happen you know so yes that was that was a real that that film was probably one of the easiest films to actually shoot that I've ever worked on don't you think yeah, that we've yeah, ever yeah. worked on I mean it was but way the most difficult way, prep way way easier than Blade Runner mm -hmm. for instance to, to to or something to oh yeah way easy to shoot it went pretty flawlessly the only thing we had the problem with was the weather because we had a cloud cover but yeah as james says the prep was enormous and and so much of that was a relationship sam myself and the production designer and the art directors about the designs of the sets and where the camera was going to move and not only what the camera was going to see but how the camera was going to move so we needed certain a pattern of the trenches we needed a certain design of the farmhouse it all had to be choreographed together so that the camera could do these moves and then we had to bring the actors in and that all had to work as well and that was a balance between 
what the actors brought to it and what we had envisioned um, for the shot. So, you know, it's it's some, sometimes a film is a very complicated exercise, but the trick is not to let that technical exercise get in the way of actually. But on 1917, the first thing that you did was discuss what you wanted to yeah, see with Sam. Without. Do you want to be tight on them? Do you want a, a single here? So get all of that down and right. then figure out how in the world are we going to do yeah, it? Yeah, just, so, just to think with a clear, clear mind what ideally you would want the camera to do, what you would want to see, and forget about technique and the the practicality of doing it so that you know that's that's really important that's that's how we approached it that's how i think how you approach any film really try try and visualize something without out any thought of technology and the how in mind even in terms of not only technology in terms of cameras and cranes and how you move it but but also in terms of the budget, the schedule, how do we actually accomplish it? Every film is a compromise. At some point, you have to compromise. But it's lovely. <laughs> Danny Villeneuve put it best. He says, we were sitting in the office talking about Sicaria, and he said, I just love prep. It's the only time you really have to dream. After that, <laughs> all the reality hits you, you know. <laughs> Yes. I remember Raj, once in some interview you said that uh, uh, that you got lucky with the weather on 1970. Oh, I've been very lucky with the weather over the years. That's, that's amazing. That's very, very lucky. You have to be blessed to have that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> up there, yeah. We yeah. have, uh, we have, have Hemant Chaturvedi with us, who's also who's been a. I mean, he's a young DP in my mind. Uh, he's done a lot of serious work with still photography and is currently working on a book himself. And I think he's uh, also curious to speak to you about your stills work. Well, namaste from India, uh, James and Roger. A very good morning to you. Um, I think I was one of the first people to buy your book in India. Uh, I think I got, a, I got a notification on Google and I went and hunted it down on Amazon and it arrived. I think within a month of it being published, which is a great achievement in India when things are not available so soon. I mean, your photographs are beautiful and they represent a certain era and a certain, you know, mind space, which is clearly evident in what you've done, you know, for the subsequent several decades. And how often have you revisited that work, you know, before the book was done, you know, before the book was done, were there certain uh, lo locales or uh, compositions or tonalities or, uh, the action within those still photographs that you ever revisited while you were working on a film? Um, uh, that's one question. Uh, I think related to that was, do you remember the first time you looked through a still camera, through a viewfinder, and what did you feel? And you missed that time ever, that era. Uh, well, you know, I, I'm with you. I, I, In the sense that I feel more and more drawn to still photography. I mean, yesterday I was wandering around London in the morning. Oh, uh, no, Saturday morning. I was wandering around from six o'clock till about 11. It got too hot uh, with my stills camera. And that probably is as rewarding to me, I think, creatively as anything I've ever done. <laughs> you know, just the, those moments, you know. I mean, the reason for the book, and uh, thank you for buying it, um, but the reason for the book was, I don't know, I had these photographs from over the years and it was, we were in COVID, you know, in, in, lockdown. in lockdown. And it's like, I would always toyed with the idea. I mean, I like books, you know, you can publish things online, but I'm very old fashioned. I like books. I buy <laughs> books, you know, I read a novel as a book. I'm not on a you know and so we we you know we thought about doing it and that was a great time to do it and um it was wonderful the publisher damiani yeah great we, we, it's it worked out wonderful but um since doing that it's really stimulated me to start taking more pictures and i've i've, I've maybe got to have another book actually <laughs> <laughs> i really i do love it and i love the simplicity and um you know, it's interesting. On our, we do a podcast. James has <laughs> invented this podcast where we talk to different 
you know, people that work in different elements in the film industry, basically. But we've talked to a couple of stills photographers. We talked to Alex Webb and we talked to Harry Griot. And Harry Griot, it's really interesting because he started out on film. He started, I think, a television company and he worked in documentaries. And I watched some of his film work and it's really good. But he said he just hated the the whole it was never his personal thing you know it was all so impersonal there were so many people involved and it was also distracting so he went to stills photography you know still photography and um that's interesting because I, I i i do love the co collaboration on set when it's working i mean obviously sometimes it doesn't work and that's why it's not very nice but most of the time i love the collaboration with a crew with the grips electricians i mean let alone obviously with the directors and stuff and the actors i i love all that but there's something about just walking the streets with my camera and just looking and every now and again wow oh. i mean yesterday i went out for a couple of hours and there was something that really drew my attention and I tried to get the shot I had in mind. It failed, but it was just a wonderful moment that where it gave me an idea for an image, you know, that I hadn't thought about before. Why would I? It was just some little thing that I saw three, you know, and I just love that exploration. So I, I'm I'm with you. I might give it all up and just <laughs> wander around with a camera. Something that you mentioned in the foreword to your book, uh, where you talk about uh being ha almost haunted by the, the images that you couldn't take, you know, because you didn't yeah. have a camera at that point of time. And I've always felt, you know, that the, 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 the biggest uh, nightmare is the untaken photograph, you know, the one that you've seen, yeah. Yeah. but you've just not been yeah. in a position to actually, you know, go ahead and take that shot. I used to, uh, I used to, I got a dark room. I used to develop all my own process and make my own prints and everything. And one day, I'd been living in LA for a while. One day I went out and took some photographs. And I know one of those photographs was really great, but I screwed up the development. <laughs> yes. So it's only in my head. I <laughs> yeah. love that photograph. But there you go. I'm I'm trying to still trying to take it, but again, right. you know, but yeah. no. you can never really revisit it's something, much, can you? <laughs> no. In fact, you know, that I've done this very big project which involved me traveling thousands of kilometers to India. And uh, I wanted to shoot that entire project on on 35 mm celluloid on still on 35 mm yeah. film, but it was just the amount of traveling that I had to do and the durations that I would have to travel. That after 60 days, if I come back with 300 or 400 rolls of film, and since yeah. most of our labs have shut down in Bombay and and, and in India, actually, mm -hmm. just that fear of someone screwing it up, you know, uh, where yeah. suddenly the yeah. documentation became more important than the format that it's being shot on. So I just quickly yeah, 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 yeah. made a decision and went back to digital and, uh, you know, yeah. made my backups every day and put them on the cloud and, and you know, laughing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I, 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 I think, though, I'll, t I'll tell when I was working in documentary, one of the early opportunities I got to do a, a documentary was on the Round the World Yacht Race. <clears throat> so I had to learn to sail and I was on a yacht for the whole Round the World Yacht Race, making a film about really more about the relationships of the people on the yacht under stress conditions and stuff. And so that was a nine month job. So I remember we got to, um, we got to, it was three different stops. We got to Auckland and I, I you know, sent the film in it every time we stopped. And, I, and we got all this stuff in a storm and all these things we'd shot. And I, I rang up the, um, I rang up, I think it was the editorial department and said, well, w what's it like? Is it OK? And they said, well, it might be OK, but it's very, very dark. It's it's very dark. I don't understand what it is, but we might be able to do something with it. Uh, I'm not sure. And I said, well, you think there's something wrong with the camera? What what do you what do you think? We don't know. It's just really kind of almost black all over. So I checked through the camera and everything. It was my own camera. I mean, I it was fine as far as concerned. So then I'm going on the next leg of the yacht race, which is another sort of six or eight weeks at sea, and thinking, well, is the camera not working? What am I doing wrong? <laughs> Got to Rio de Janeiro, rang up, what, 
for Daly's report. Oh, yeah, no, that's all right. So I think, well, what was the problem with that footage? So when we get back to England, all the time back to England, I went in the cutting room. There was a flatbed. I was looking at the film on the flatbed. And I took out the film and looked at it. And the whole thing, it wasn't just the image was black. The whole thing was it. They used fog, fog film stock. They printed on very cheap uh, dailies printing stock, and it was all fogged. And so it was nothing to do with what I was doing. But then that for, for like four months, I'm thinking, you know, this whole sort of eight or nine weeks in the Southern Ocean and all this stuff with icebergs is all lost. Were you overexposing at that point? <laughs> I mean, you don't know what to do. And so, I mean, I love digital. You can just go, oh, I've got it. Well, I haven't got it. No. I mean, While I have been a big fan of your work, et cetera, et cetera, the day that I really warmed up to you, uh, in a very special way was when you were on a, a, a documentary called Cinematography Style. And you turned it, and you talk about the intimacy of the camera with the character and you bollock the documentary cameraman for being too far away. And you ask him oh, to yeah, come yeah, closer yeah. and he finally comes closer and you have kept needling him till he did that. I think I just laughed myself silly on that day. It was, and it was so true. Now, the last question is that uh, you also worked on uh, an animation film. And that's something that I have in common with you, uh, which is I did one animation film in India as well. And I've read about, you know, how you had to convince people to create the lighting where the animators wanted to, you know, keep everything brighter. And we got away with silhouettes and, you know, highlights and everything. But how was it for you working with animation film? I know you started with Wally and then uh, more actively on Rango. Yeah, I, I loved it. I, again, I loved the collaboration with a whole whole group of of of, of artists and technicians that uh, that I hadn't met before. And yeah, no, it's the same. You're doing the same thing. You but know. you also help them redo their lighting software because their software, if you wanted a light to come down, hit the floor, and bounce up. It would be a light here and a light here. There was they didn't know how light worked so right. we had this the, the, yeah they, the, the, it was a matter of yeah again it was a matter of working with people on the technology but also on the creative side yeah. and the instinctual side and oh i mean and it's the same language you know you're just using different method to get there really right um so i, I really enjoyed it i mean i'm not sure I'm going to do any more because I, I don't know where to go with it really and 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 animation seems stuck in a rut Really, yes, yeah. pseudo pseudo realism, as you said. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. yeah. Anyway, thank you very much. I should. Yeah, no. Thank I you, know. sir. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Kiran, Kiran is a cinematographer who, uh, well, we are kind of uh, colleagues. We were in the same film school at the same time. Kiran Devhans has a question for you. Hi, um, Roger James. Good morning. Hi. Uh, being Hi. a big fan of your work all along. My question is very a uh, small question, basically two questions. One is that uh, a lot of times a senior DOP like you and sometimes we in India land up working with a first time director. So to handle them is a, a little tricky part. So how do you interact with them to make them comfortable and, and uh, do what you actually want to do as a DOP? Yeah, but I mean, you know, it's not what I want to do as a DOP. You know, you've just got to find out what 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 they want, what their perspective is on 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 the script. I mean, I think that's the most important thing you do before you start any movie, whether you've worked with that director or not, is to find out their perspective on the material. Because sometimes, I mean, it has happened that I've read a script and I've met with a director. And they've had a different interpretation, or they have a different slant on that material to what I have. And it has been that I didn't see a way those two things were going to work. You know, uh, we were going to be able to work together on it. Uh, so that really important first time director. I mean, a first time director is getting to direct because they've got something that has got them to that position. You know, I'm not directing; they are. But you're so, also helping him by explaining that you need to think, you, get together what you're trying to say in this yeah, movie and what not, you want it to be and communicate that. 
and then let the other people help you by telling you how it could be done. But uh, you yeah. need to give. I worked support. with one director that he wasn't the first time, but he hadn't done much before. And he got this great opportunity. And it was a major thing. He wanted to show off. He wanted yeah. to do all the things he couldn't do with a low budget because now he had a big budget. So he wanted to move a camera and do all these ostentation shots. And he said, well, well why? You know, I, I, in some times you've got to, you've got to, you don't have to do anything, but sometimes it's kind of good to talk to somebody and say, well, what do you really need out of this exactly. shot? Why do you want to move the camera? You know, it's really about character and, and you should concentrate, shouldn't you, really on getting the thing that drew you to the project in the first place and not mm -hmm. think about, you know, make, making it look spectacular. You know, what's spectacular is the material, not, not, not you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah it's a very uh, tricky thing because sometimes uh, if you tell them that, don't move the camera too much here and there. You've got to focus on the main character. A lot of them take it positively. A lot of them take it little, um, they, they're offensive about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's true. It's true. But you know, that's the thing. I mean, so much of it, isn't it, is it's about trust. It's about a relationship, building a relationship with trust. That's why I like a lot, a lot of prep. If it's somebody I haven't worked with before, or oh, even if I have, I, I love I love that prep time in you. You discuss the script, you look at locations, you talk with a production designer about sets or whatever is involved and and and, and, and you build a relationship and trust, hopefully, you know. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us. Thanks. Right. No. Rajan James, just to let you know that there are still photographers in the room. There's film journalists and a pretty full house here. I just want to call right. in a very young still photographer who also writes about photography. And uh, that's uh, Raj Lalwani. Is he here? Yeah, there he is. Hi, James. Hi, Roger. Hi. 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 Uh, Roger, I, I, I heard with great interest where you said that your work is, even your cinematography work is reactive or responsive to the script. And in that sense, you kind of connect your cinematography approach to the way a lot of street photographers work to the way a lot of still photographers work. But in cinema, there is always an editor who, who takes your vision and then interprets it in conjunction with the script, in conjunction with the director. How did you do this in your photo book? How did you do this in by ways? What were the decisions you took while compiling, editing, sequencing, especially considering that a lot of these photographs were not made with the book in sight. They were they were made a long right. time ago, over several years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, again, we had quite a bit of time in lockdown just to yes, sort yeah. of to to sort of juggle them. Um, it was a lot of back and forth too with the publisher Damiani, which was good because it was an outside eye. So we pulled together a bunch of photographs and then with them called down to a number, but then it went back and forth every so often. It's like, no, let's bring back this one and take that one out. Yeah, some of it, I mean, some of it, it's, I mean, a lot of it is purely just photography and photographs that I've taken that I like, but I also, I guess I wanted also to include a little bit of my, my life and experience. So there's things in there that, um, I don't think of special photographs, but they reflect a yeah. time and a moment, I suppose. Yeah. So, you know, it was, it's a combination, really. I don't think it's, as I said at the beginning in the book, I'm not a stills photographer. I don't see myself as that. So the book is just things that I connect with as much as uh, it is. It was also really interesting that the distributors of the book got in touch with the uh, publisher and said, well, we'd like to see move, uh, stills from movies. We'd like to see yeah, things that he's I... taken on movies. And Roger didn't want to do that. He wanted no. to separate it. And Damiani was great in supporting him in that. Yes. I, did, I, I didn't want to do a, a film book or anything like that. So there's just really one photograph in the book. That's like a kind of like, okay, well, I work on films, but... <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and a lot of publishers would were, were agreeing to publish the book if Roger agreed to do a, a book, book on movies. Yeah, and so. we 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 didn't want it. We wanted it to stand on its own, and we found the right publisher. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I understand yeah. the temptations of that. I mean, I I understand that publishers would also want to you know play up to that. Uh, but that that yeah, photograph yeah. of the chair that said director. I mean that. It was the right yeah. amount of play uh, that you put into right. the edit. Uh, I, I yeah. also want to ask one question that's more related to cinema, though I do see parallels in photography as well. Uh, despite the romance of watching a film in a darkened hall on a big screen, uh, the reality is that more and more people are watching cinema on smaller screens, something you alluded to a while back. Uh, we're seeing this a lot more in India, especially since the pandemic uh, yeah. happened. Um, and it's similar to photography where the tangibility of the, of the still photograph, of the print, of the book uh, is, uh, you know, be, being slowly replaced by the Instagram cell phone uh, interface. Does it influence the way in which you shoot? Does it way, influence the way you imagine or interpret a film? Does it change the way you look at characters or look at scale or something like that? I think it affects scale in a way. You know, you do, you do, you are aware of if 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 a film is 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 predominantly going to be seen on a TV screen or on an iPhone, then then it's very hard to do wide wide shots, isn't it? I mean, you know, you know. I mean, again, I go back to the reason for the book. It's like I I like things printed. I like something tangible in front of me, not not on a computer screen, you know, like on a digital screen. I, and I, I like pictures on a wall. I go to an art gallery. I don't want. I mean, I do watch. I do look at paintings by Edward Munch, my favorite painter. I mean, I'll look at them online, but I'm looking. For, I've been to the gallery, and we're going to Oslo hopefully in a while. And I shall go to the museum and I'll stand there for hours looking at Edward Munch's paintings on the wall. I mean, there's something about that relationship that's different than seeing them on a computer screen. There just is. And uh, in the same way, there's something about watching a movie in a cinema or in a darkened space. Uh, that relationship, your relationship to the screen. Yeah, I know there's the audience relationship and being in a room with a lot of people, but there is that. But there is also something about that relationship to the screen that is different than watching it uh, uh, on on an iPhone or on a TV even, really. I mean... And you also don't know how it's going to look on some of the smaller... Um, well, that's the, that's the consistency yeah. of the look. is yeah. crazy, it? could isn't be it? brighter because someone's screen is, yeah, I mean, is pumped up and... I was even even in a timing house one time, and they, you know, we were doing a, a, a transfer for for television, you know, DVD transfer, and I said, "Well, it's getting too. It's all a little green." I, I was just watching something that they'd done, and and the guy said, "Well, yeah, it might be on this monitor. That one, no. Well, it's looking <laughs> on that monitor, which is magenta, uh, and that's too magenta. Well, what about this one?" <laughs> That's ridiculous. And that was in, you know, that was in actually, you know, a, a timing suite where I was supposed to be watching a perfect representation of my work, you know, let alone somebody's TV set in Wyoming or wherever, you know, I mean, it's incredible, isn't it? You know, so, yeah, there's something about going and seeing a movie on a screen because, you know, that's what they intended. <laughs> So yeah. there's a, another still photographer in the room, Swapan Parekh, lots of interesting work that he does. And his question is that uh, he notices a recurring visual motif of the lone human in an urban landscape. Uh, right through byways, one sees that as a recurring motive in the book. And yeah. So I was just wondering, you know, is it something that comes from the subconscious or is it something that you look for? And did it follow you into your cinematography also? I think that, that I like simplicity, you know. Um, I like simplicity. So I'm drawn to simple things. And I like figures in a landscape. I guess when I was a kid painting, it was usually about a single figure or maybe two figures in a landscape. And maybe that is why I'm drawn to Edward Munch's work, because they, <laughs> they're quite spare and it's usually about <laughs> a character in deep angst. <laughs> so, you know, there's maybe a, that's... There's a picture on uh, 
there's almost a hitchcockian uh, character on page 112 sitting along a wall and looking through a like a square aperture with oh, m yeah. m on the oh, wall yeah 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 <laughs> that, reminded me of yeah, that was in that was it we were walking we were walking around dresden you know okay. it's, and uh it was just yeah like oh, wow that's such a strange thing. image <laughs> i just love the idea you know and it's sort of you kind of think well what's he looking at i mean we can see what he's looking at but hopefully the in the photograph people are what is he looking at why is he just <laughs> in it on a chair and he's is that his day how long has he been there how long will he be there does he come every day is he watching a building going up will he be there when it's finished <laughs> i i mean i i love those sort of yeah but maybe that's me psychologically <laughs> there's uh there's a, a film journalist in the room nandini are you there nandini ramnathan hi Really honored to be here. Thank you, ISC, for having me, uh, Mr. Beacons. Uh, you worked across formats, genres, aesthetic styles. You worked in celluloid, digital. Um, Raj asked a uh, uh, question about the future of the image in the age of the cell phone and streaming. How is the role of cinematography and the cinematographer itself, according to you, changed over the years? Um. But I think it is definitely changing. I mean, the way I feel very lucky to have been uh, involved in film for the time I have, you know. Um, but then you're a creature of your own time, aren't you? Anyway, I mean, now, yeah, and now it's it, the, the creation of an image is so much more involved. The fact that so much more is of an image is animation. What what is live action? What what is very few films are completely free of digital enhancement in some way you know um you very rarely see anybody do a, a large crowd scene i was just thinking of gandhi sorry but i mean just because it is uh the film gandhi and the number of extras what was it ten thousand they had to shoot that I mean, you just couldn't imagine something like that being done done now, or Lawrence of Arabia. How much of Lawrence of Arabia, if it was made now, would be would be uh, CGI effects? You know, I mean, you'd have Lawrence standing on a train against blue screen. Maybe the train wouldn't be there. You know, I, I, I so yeah, the role of the cinematographer is changing because of that, and and getting back to talking about still photography and that relationship with what's in front of you that maybe that's what's pushing me a little bit more back to the simplicity of just being alone with the camera and reality you know uh, I, I i think i think filmmaking is becoming more and more unreal and i think right now there's this um sort of redefinition as the cinematographer as the overseer of the visual because when visual effects started climbing up and because there's so much visual involved in that and it happens afterwards yeah. and they can completely change a shot so there's a definite <clears throat> struggle struggle to say no the cinematographer needs to oversee that part too right. because mm -hmm. overall they should be the arbiter of the visual of that mm, film. It becomes more like I feel my relationship or a cinematographer's relationship on a movie is getting more like my relationship on an animated film to that film, where it is the overseeing it. Uh, on an animated film, I'm not the person that actually lights it or, or creates the shot mm. in the computer. I might be there when they're doing camera capture with standing actors in a virtual set but i'm not the person holding that uh computer screen or you whatever the ipad that, that they're actually using um but i'm kind of overseeing it and putting in my my um making my comments of the overall look and maybe controlling in some sense the the the, the overall look and i think that's where a cinematographer's role is going mm -hmm. and it's it's slightly detached from the actual i mean that's why i still operate the camera i've always operated the camera i mean i want that relationship 
I want the relationship I have with a stills camera to my subject, except for usually when I'm with a stills camera, I try not to talk to anybody or let them know I've taken a photograph, which is obviously different on a movie. But I want that relationship with myself, the lens and where I am with the subject. And I think that's becoming less and less. And also, as there are more and more high budget movies, they're doing multiple units because financially that helps them make it within a shorter period of time. Yeah. And um, that's difficult at best. And when we did Blade Runner, because it was with Denis and he agreed it should be a single camera um, mm. shoot, the uh, line producer just kept having trouble with that and saying, but we've got budgeted nine other cameras. When are you using these yeah, cameras? Like when a, are you? So it was a great ploy to use when you wanted something and they said oh it's not in the budget but, oh, we didn't use the nine <laughs> yeah cameras, it's, so. it's, it's strange that every there seems like a formulaic way of shooting a film so if it's action you have to have lots of cameras but yeah. it, i think it the strange thing is you know when they were when when you know the classic films of the past where you know whether it's misfits or how to whatever the films that i love of the past shooting on film or think further back, Red Badger Courage, for instance, you read about Houston's trying to move the camera, these long tracking shots that had never been done before, you know, with these huge cameras and the kind of equipment they had to use. And they create something that's really quite fluid and kind of amazing. But now we have like, you know, lipstick cameras and stuff with high quality that you can do anything you want. But somehow we we're becoming more removed from the subject rather mm. than more connected i mean that's a generalization obviously there's films being made you know many films being made that 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 you would say yeah that's pretty amazing a, a film called compartment number nine uh uh, uh the, what was it last year or the year before i thought was amazing which is obviously shot kind of minimal but it actually was shot on film which is surprising because it looks like it was shot on digital because it's so fluid and so connected to the subject so there's exceptions but as a general generalization of the way movies are going because movies seem to be going and everybody's talking about big movies about superheroes and action it's it's going in a very sort of distanced i think disconnected way really yeah. thank you thank you very much Quickly, let me just go back to a cinematographer who's actually whose question is also along the same lines of future of cinematography, technology, virtual production. Uh, Fauzia, are you there? Hi, Roger. Hi, James. Hi. Uh, it's a beautiful Hi. day, actually. <laughs> I happen to be with everybody, all lovers of cinema, lovers of life. And uh, I'd like to ask you the way it is evolving, artificial intelligence and cinematography. What is your take on it? That's funny. Somebody asked that question yesterday. We were talking to a group of people in China. Um, they seem preoccupied with the idea of uh, artificial intelligence being able to take over cinematography. So that would you would have a film shot by artificial intelligence. Well, um, personally, I don't believe artificial intelligence will ever ever get to the level of a human being i don't think it will it i'm not saying artificial intelligence won't evolve and become create a race of something that <clears throat> will be the end of us that might actually happen <laughs> but <laughs> I, I don't think artificial intelligence will ever replace our eyes and I mean our eyes on a general sense of a human being's responses to the world around them. I don't think you, artificial intelligence will ever do that in the same way as humans do. So I don't see it as a worry, really. Uh, but not in that sense. I th see it as a worry in many other senses. I, any more than anybody else knows where the world's going right now, it seems to be a very confusing place. <laughs> Artificial intelligence is only one little element of that confusion. Um, but virtual production, all the various other mapping techniques, all that technology is already in play in uh, many ways in our right. family. So, right. And I, I think it, I mean, any technology 
it's how it's used i mean it, again it's the existence of the technology i do think roger that you've answered this in your own way many times is that uh, you know you like to operate you like to be close to the subject therefore you own the image you want to create it by yourself all that is all very well taken but i think there's a lot of anxiety on uh, surrounding us right now of where where it's all headed yeah that's my point really about films going towards <clears throat> you know uh, cg and they're being created in a computer and uh, yes but um that's 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 the way technology has been used and it's um it, it, oh overused in the same way that <clears throat> You know, when Steadicam first came in, when Steadicam was invented, Garrett right. invented Garrett Brown invented Steadicam and it first came in, it was incredibly overused. And it, it wasn't it wasn't it was just suddenly the cameras going everywhere. And the only time when it when it's really when it was really well used in the early days was on a film like Come and See, you know, the Klimos film, Come and See. Suddenly you realize wow that's great technology because look what you can do with it um not just kind of float the camera for the sake of it you know so it's again it's technology it's it's how it's used and where it's used i mean i i think it's a great advantage to be able to do a battle scene with thousands of warriors and only have to have 20 extras to do it i mean cause it is because such a waste of resources that could go somewhere else but um, I say it's the way it's used. If it's the way it's it's creating films that are completely, I was going to say mindless, and I think they are. Um, but they're 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 also so disconnected from the real world. That's 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 the thing that uh, I react against. But then it's just my personal preferences of movies. I like films about characters, and I like taking pictures of single people in landscapes. So there you are. That's just me. <laughs> Uh, just going back to the roots, uh, do you have, have memory and recall of uh, your first relation to light? I mean, how did you actually begin, I know, in your childhood memories about light? I started off, my big passion was fishing. So when, when, I, when I was at school, I would always go fishing before school and fishing after school. And sometimes I would stay out all night fishing. And I still go fishing. And that so... <laughs> the great thing about that is that you experience a lot of different lights. <laughs> uh, Setu is uh, in the room. Setu is a young DP and just finished a very big film which is out in the theatres. I think he wants to speak about stills, right? Your, his still, your still work. Yeah, I have a question which has already been actually asked. So I'm going to ask you something else, Roger. Hi, Roger. Hi, James. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, hi, really. hi. It's an honour. And... Uh, I'm going to quote you on something you've said once in one of your interviews, which is like shooting documentaries gives you a sensibility of reacting to things as they happen. And that's quite similar even on a film set. And you've also said that in documentaries, uh, you tend to spend a lot of time among the people you're going to shoot so that they're comfortable and not as aware of your presence. Yeah. My, que my question is this, uh, how do you prepare when you're shooting fiction with the actors, with, with the talent that you're working with? not necessarily the bigger stars but how do you spend time do you get to spend time and do you make it a point to actually make the actors comfortable and what is your relationship with the actors in fiction well i think so much of a cinematographer's job is is creating space for the actors and and that's <clears throat> obviously that's your personal relationship with them but also your your crews the onset crews personal relationship um i mean i make it a point of 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 working with a crew that are very quiet very very much get on with it no nonsense not not you know I, my the focus well assistant i work with i've worked with for 30 odd years he doesn't ever use a tape measure he doesn't need to i mean he's just you know so you create an atmosphere where that where you, you you you're supportive of the actors i always like to do I always like to do makeup and hair tests, not because I need to see or costume tests, not because I need to see them on camera, but I like to start a relationship. I, I like to <clears throat> I like people to meet each each other before they actually start on a production. On, on a very relaxed yeah, day. On a relaxed day. 
that's not always possible because sometimes an actor doesn't come into the day of the shoot, which is, you know, that's the way it is. But um, I say, yeah, you want to just, and you've got to gauge what an actor wants. I mean, as some actors we work with that don't want to know anything about the camera. In fact, they would wish that there wasn't a camera. And there's other actors that that really want a relationship with the operator, I would, which would be me. And they want you to kind of give them feedback from their performance from take to take. So it's really gauging what that the particular actor needs from from you, you know, I think. I'm going to quote you again, Roger. Uh, I used to shoot black and white film. Now I shoot a color file and I use Photoshop. Is that something that's from an IndieWire interview? I just want to ask you, uh, how do you visualize the black and white tones when you're shooting color? Or do you process it then and there? Or do you change the LUT on the camera? And how are you seeing the black and white tones when you're shooting color? I think I just see in black and white, frankly. I mean, I, I think I do anyway. I mean, obviously, aware of color when you're shooting a movie and, 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 and lighting. So maybe that doesn't make sense. But... I mean, I'm really looking at a composition and the way the light falls before I'm looking at the color balance within it. And when I said that, it was before I have a like a monochrome camera and the sensor was screwed because most of them were because it was a manufacturing fault. <clears throat> but it's actually recently been fixed. And I love that camera. It's black and white and it will always be black and white, <laughs> that image. And I love it. So I'm probably not going to use the color color camera I have. Okay. Uh, Thank you so much. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Uh, I'll just call Rajiv Menon in for just for a brief question. Last question, uh, James and Roger. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. So in, in this particular uh, uh, book that you have, there is a lot of visual memory that you seem to have a sense of what happened in the past that you have. Do you go back to this, uh, your past to create these timeless images because your images have a certain timeless quality? Yeah, I don't know if that's really intentional. Um, I'm, I'm not, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, <laughs> the, the first job I got, which was this, at this art center in North Devon, and it was <clears throat> my brief really was to record country life and the way it was before it died out. I mean, rural life was changing very quickly in <clears throat> in the countryside in um, in the southwest of England at that time in seventy seventy one. Um, but I, I kind of I was never very good at that of recording the time and the period. Uh, I, I, I somehow I don't think I was very good at that. I was just more interested in taking my own personal photographs. So I, 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 maybe that's why they're a bit more timeless because they're they're small things. They're not really about the period. They're about <clears throat> more about a character or somebody's relationship to a landscape. You know, so maybe I hadn't thought of that really, but it's true, isn't it? So, guys, uh, I think we should, uh, like I said, that they have uh, it's a working day for them. I think we should uh, let them go. I just yeah. one last observation, uh, Roger, is that uh, I know that you've spoken a lot about uh, what now we can call authorship or owning the image. But uh, in the current scenario, a lot of us are being uh, asked to sign off on intellectual property rights. And I just want to quickly ask you, how is, how is it playing out in the West or where you work? We have yeah. to sign off too. It's part yeah. of the contract. Yeah, we we sign off, but um, you know, there's no real in in America. There's no real <coughs> cinematographers' rights. You know, they they've been eroded. Basically, <coughs> we're below the line crew, and uh, that that's fine. I I don't really have a I don't really have a big deal about make a big deal of that. I mean, you know, I mean, I feel. I've been lucky enough to shoot films and do the work I've done. And the films exist. Um, I worked on them. And some of them I'm, I would say I'm quite proud of, actually. Some of them I think are very good films. And they have something to say and they reflect 
the human condition, not to use an overused expression. But uh, um, so I'm just very thankful for the life I have and a career I've had and hope to do a bit more, you know. Um, authorship. I don't, I'm not really into that, you know. Well, except that you would really not like it if they use it for a Coca Cola commercial. No, I mean or that. That's, but you don't yeah, have that control. Yeah, and you don't have that control. I think it says something. I mean, the cinematographer is bringing the image. I mean, that cinematographer is creating a lot, and for them to say, "Well, you you don't have authorship," is denying what they do in a way. But there's nothing yeah, that but, you can do about it. So it's yeah. a long, it's a long, uh, very vexed kind of battle right now. And so <laughs> I just wanted yeah. to yeah. you yeah. on it. So, yeah. well, yeah. what can we say? Thank you once more. Thank you very much. And congratulations on all the, you know, the honors that you, it, uh, we kind of take from it. It makes us also proud that, you know, a cinematographer was honored by the Queen of England and you had your OBE moment recently. Yeah. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> seriously amazing. I, I, I mean, I think, as you say, I think the honors for all of us, really, because I don't know why it would be me. But anyway, no, and uh, I think you said as much at the at the ceremony, you know, that you shared it with the team, and that was all very, very, yeah. good, very yeah. good to hear. Yeah, and the community. Yeah, we all share, we all share what we do with other people. Except for when we wander the streets by ourselves with our cameras. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's been lovely having the both of you in our room. And uh, I know that every single person in this room is waiting to ask, when will you come to India? Yeah. <laughs> I've been to India a few times, but I'd love to come again. When? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah, let's see if we can work something out. Yeah. 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 Oh, I love it. Fascinating. Love, mm. I love my time in India. I've been quite a few different parts really so yeah i'd love to come back we'd love to do an exhibition of this there we go. Yeah, yeah 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 that can be easily fixed. let me tell you that it can be easily organized and there'll be lots of people willing to help so anytime all right uh, forward to it. Oh, yeah. very good yeah. <laughs> all right it's been an absolute pleasure yeah. thank, thank you, you so you. much thank, thank you. you all thank <laughs> you all <laughs> This has been really lovely. Enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs> you all take care. You too. Thank you. Bye. You too. Bye-bye. Bye bye.